we doing today? Awesome. Woohoo! Yeah, I am excited. As soon as I can get this up and running. There we go. Beautiful. Peace and goodwill to all men. We are about to enter and we're about to celebrate that most wondrous of seasons that is Christmas. And I am very excited for Christmas 2021. And not just that, but, you know, we have been celebrating a number of things. We've been celebrating Thanksgiving, and thanks for our positioning on both sides of the border, both in Canada and, of course, the States. We've celebrated those days. And I have this privilege of sharing with you today during a time where we've also been remembering times of difficulty and struggle, of course, because we remembered in November on the 11th, Remembrance Day. Now, of course, Remembrance Day, which was also known as Armistice Day, was first celebrated in 1919. It was known as Armistice Day because it was a celebration of the Armistice Agreement that ended the First World War. And we celebrate it on the 11th of the 11th of the 11th. Important numbers, actually, spiritually as well. I find it fascinating. Now, World War I, the great war, also known as the war to end all wars, primarily because the devastation and sheer number of casualties was meant to be a deterrent for us to ever see conflict on such a scale ever again. But in the midst of that level of destruction, in, that, in the midst of the level of loss of life, in that time of absolute hopelessness, there were times and pockets of hope and joy and celebration. The most notable of those was Christmas, 1914. In the early months of the war, there had been a constant push and pull on both sides of the conflict in an effort to gain ground. And in doing so, they built and dug trenches to try and flank the opposing forces. By November of 1914, they came to a standstill because literally they had nowhere else to go because they had drunk, tr dug trenches literally from one side of the conflict to the other side. And so they came to that standstill, separated by a contested ground known as no man's land, entrenched in muddy trenches, close enough that the armies could shout to each other. And 1914, Christmas, 100,000 soldiers on both sides, British and German, celebrated Christmas. The Germans initiated by putting candles up in their trenches and then also putting candles on makeshift Christmas trees. They started singing Christmas carols, which could be heard across no man's land. And the British responded in kind and started singing with them. Things were broken. At some point, they felt comfortable to go into no man's land and to meet each other. Gifts were exchanged, little trinkets, buttons, hats, whatever they could find. There was a silence unheard of since the conflict had started. No more whistling of machine gun bullets, no more cracks of the guns. The, the silence of the explosions was deafening. But in its place, we saw songs and cautious revelry because it was Christmas and the two sides were celebrating together. Many soldiers marked on that unusual silence. And there were, there were many letters written during that time that we have access to that just remarked and celebrated the unusual beauty of what was happening as they celebrated Christmas together. There were even tentative attempts, some successful, at starting soccer games in the devastation of no man's land. Christmas 1914, for a group of them, there was peace and goodwill among them. As so we remember that and we celebrate that, we have an inherent God-given need for unity and togetherness. Yes, even when we look at the world and we see all of the chaos and the destruction and the anger and the bitterness of a fallen world, there is an inherent God-given need to come 
together. Christmas 1914 showed that when there seemed to be no opportunity for unity, there was unity to be found. In worst case scenarios, that need for unity can sometimes take us in dark places. We see, we see the, the desire to belong to something greater than ourselves when, when you see young, young people um, join gangs, join cults. In a slightly more frivolous way, when we come together and celebrate our favorite team, when we come together with hundreds, if not thousands of strangers, we celebrate when the team wins. We despair when the team loses. Thousands of strangers united under a common goal because there is an inherent need for us to belong to something greater than ourselves. Let's start at the source. My topic today is called The Power of One. We were never designed to function, to thrive, to exist alone. Relationship and togetherness is the foundation of how we were always meant to live. Outside of God, there can never be true, long-lasting unity because God in, him, in himself defines what perfect and total togetherness is. Better together isn't just a my sentiment. There is exponential kingdom power available when we come together as one. This message is called The Power of One, and I'll be sharing God's heart, his command for us, his children to work together as one, one body united under the one God. My first point is just that. God is one. There is but one God. But from the Bible and how God has revealed himself to us, we understand that God has revealed himself as a trinity. All one God, but we see him expressed as God the Father, God the Son Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. God as the trinity has always existed. So God has always existed in perfect unity with himself. He exists in perfect relationship within himself. God is love. And love, being by its very definition selfish, or selfless, sorry, has to be expressed outside of ourselves, has to be expressed one another. And since God is the only being who has ever existed for eternity, with no beginning or no end, because he is love, that love has to have been expressed within himself, hence the Trinity. One way we can look at or try to understand the Trinity as much as it's possible is to look at water. Water exists in three distinct states. It exists as a solid, as ice, as liquid, as water, and as a gas or vapor, as steam. The molecular structure of water, what makes water, water, H2O, two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen, is the same for all three states. Ice is water, water is water, vapor is water. And to take that illustration further, at the perfect temperature and at the perfect pressure, water exists in all three states together in perfect unity and perfect harmony. Our God is one God, but expressed in perfect unity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has and always will exist in perfect relationship with himself. So it is an undeniable key characteristic of who he is, his values, and his commandments. And by extension, as his created beings, as reflections of who he is, it is absolutely an indispensable part of our identity as well. Towards the end of his ministry, Jesus prayed the following in John 17, verses 20 through 23. And in these verses, Jesus is interceding and praying to his heavenly father for those who are following at the time and all those who would follow him. He says in verse 21 to his father, I pray that they will all be one, just, in, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. In the very beginning, when God created the earth. He looked at all aspects of creation and said, it is good. When God created Adam, however, he made this statement in Genesis 2.18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. 
it is not good for the man to be alone. So God is good. He doesn't just do good. He defines what good is. There is no good outside of God. So when God said it is not good for Adam to be alone, he was saying that Adam's solitude was not representative of God's values. Adam, in his aloneness, was not a perfect image of God's eternal existence in complete relational harmony. It is not good for man to be alone, because it is not of God for man to be alone. Now, keep in mind that this was before the fall of man. This was before sin entered the equation and enmity between man and God had entered. And yet God said it was necessary for Adam to have a partner, even in this perfect state. This does not take away, of course, that God is fully sufficient for every need that we possibly have. Our first commandment is indeed to love God with absolutely everything we have. But the second commandment is to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourselves. This point highlights just how absolutely fundamentally important relationship is to our God. How God's perfect plan has always intended for us to exist, function, and thrive in supportive community. And this brings me to my second point. We are one. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 12, says the following. Two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, and the threefold cord is not quickly broken. So it's a relatively straightforward concept, and when we understand that adding greater numbers of strands to strings, to branches, to wire, we understand that collectively adding extra parts will increase the strength as a whole. It's a very simple concept. It's, it's the basis to, you know, stronger together, better together, supporting together. I mean, when you have a single strand of string or rope or wire, and it's holding a load, what happens when that string snaps or you cut that? The load falls. But when you have multiple strands tied together and it's holding that same load, when one of those strands snaps, what happens to the load? It stays. And not just that, but the broken string is still there. It doesn't magically disappear. It, too, is supported by the other string. Delving a little deeper into that illustration, when you engineer rope, there are many different ways that you can tie them together to, uh, to you know, pull them together as rope. You know, you can twist them together. But when you braid the rope together, there is greater strength achieved. When the rope is braided together, it allows the rope to support the weight evenly across the strands. Because what's happening is that by braiding the rope, the individual strands are actually working together as one. And even greater strength is achieved when you have double braided rope, when you have a braided core surrounded by another braided layer, because you're removing even more of the gaps in between the strands, achieving greater strength. In removing the distance between the strands, when the strands are working as one, you have strength and you have support. There is much strength, encouragement, support, and safety to be found when we come together as one. When we come together as one under a single banner or purpose that is Jesus, there is power. The church, and here I'm talking about, of course, the collective of all believers together worldwide, not just you know, an individual building. We are called the body of Christ under the head that is Jesus. And the thing about bodies is that they are made up of very distinct parts working together for whatever the body needs in that moment. Something as simple as reaching out and picking up an object requires the coordination of many different systems within the body. You have the brain and the nervous system sending signals to tell the body to pick it up. You have the muscles and the tendons working together with the skeletal system to reach out. You've got the eyes providing depth perception. You've got the feel of touch allowing the body to know that, yes, I have this in my hand. Not to mention, if this is far away, then my legs have to be part of that equation. And then you've got all of the secondary systems that are important for the body to be able to get to that point. I mean, the food that we eat provides the energy that we need to be able to come pick this up. The oxygen in my lungs that is spread throughout my body is needed to be alive so that I can actually go 
and pick up with peace. The body is distinct, disparate parts, all working together. It's not something that we even think about. When we do this, there is so much happening in unity. When one of my body systems is out of sync, or when it is actively fighting it against what I'm trying to do, the task becomes immeasurably harder. We as a church need to function as the body functions. All disparate parts, all our different experiences, all our different giftings, all our different strengths, personalities, everything working together to fulfill a singular purpose. A purpose that only can be achieved when the body of Christ is united under the purpose of Jesus, our head. I don't think I could ever overemphasize the importance of unity and the body of Christ. And the Bible is full of commands, like exhortations to come together. There's stories and illustrations on the importance of us working together in unity. Unfortunately, this does, I mean, unity works for good or for bad. When you look in the Bible, in Genesis, of course, you know, God's commandment had been for everybody to go, to fill the earth, to multiply, to subdue the earth. But what happens is that we find in chapter 11 that the people of the world had come together and had settled in rebellion to that command. And in that rebellion, they said, let us build a city. Let us build a tower that reaches to the heavens so that the world may see how great we are. And God made the following statement when he saw that unification under this selfish ambition. He said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Nothing will be impossible for them because to gather together in their rebellion, the unity they experienced was such that there was nothing that they wouldn't be able to achieve or accomplish. And that is when there is evil intention. So imagine when we come together under the one, the ultimate purpose and banner that is Jesus Christ. There are principles in place, both in the natural and the supernatural, that just work. In the natural, of course, we have things like mathematical principles, we have physics, gravity works for everyone, it doesn't matter. As the Bible puts it, it reigns on the just and the unjust alike. God has made creation to work in a particular way, but it's the same for the spiritual, it's the same for the unseen. In Matthew 18, 19 to 20, Jesus says this, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. This is a spiritual principle. Our agreement, our coming together, our unity under God, in agreement with him, invites him and all of the abundant resources of heaven into our situation. And this is where things get fun. <laughs> the Bible says one shall chase a thousand and two shall chase 10,000. And that's Deuteronomy 32.20. When we are aligned in agreement with God, when he is for us and as his children, he is for us we tap into the exponential power of his kingdom. One equals a thousand fled. Two equals not 2,000, but 10,000. That is the principle of exponential growth. And to explain that concept in a fun way, there's a story that does a great job. So I'll read that story to you. There was once a king in India who was a big chess enthusiast and had the habit of challenging wise visitors to a game of chess. And one day a traveling sage you know, he came to see the king, and the king extended that challenge to him. And the sage, having played chess all his life, gladly accepted the challenge. The king, to motivate the sage, said that if he won, he could have any reward that he could name. And so the sage said, okay, absolutely. If I win, what I want you to do is, I want you to place a single grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard, then a second on the second, and then we're going to double it. So it'll be one, two, four, Eight, continue so. The king was like, okay. And then he lost the game. <laughs> so he grabbed a bag of rice, and then he started counting out the grains of rice. It wasn't long before he realized that he was going to need a lot more than a single bag to fulfill this promise. Because by the 20th square on that chessboard, he needed one million grains of rice. And by the 40th, he needed 
one billion grains of rice. Can anyone want to hazard a guess by the time he got to the last and 64th square what that number was? Britt, if you wouldn't mind throwing that number up. That is the number of grains of rice on the 64th square, which means that across the entire board, if you wouldn't mind, Britt, second number, that is the number of grains of rice across the entire board thanks to the power of exponential growth. Over 18 quintillion numbers. Funnily enough, I actually took the time and I did the math. I sat down with my iPhone calculator and I did the math and two things. One, yes, those numbers are correct. And two, the iPhone has to do some very fun things to display a number that big. Anyway, if you have five minutes of your life to spare, I challenge you to do the same. But yes, so it was at this point that the king realized that this was going to be impossible. And the sage in all his grace and mercy said, you know what? You don't have to pay it all now. You can pay it over a lifetime. And in doing so, became the world's wealthiest person. That number, 18 quintillion, what's well, grains of sand? What could, you know, what could possibly be the size of 18 quintillion grains of sand? They're tiny. It's the equivalent to 210 billion tons which is enough to cover the entire landmass of India in a layer that is over three feet thick. That is the power of exponential growth. And that is the spiritual principle that we tap into when we come together in unity. Something hit me when I was uh, preparing this message. If, any, if anybody has ever had the thought, well, what do I have to give? You know, is my presence really necessary? Look at the difference between the 63rd and the 64th square on that board. One person in unity under the kingdom principle of exponential growth absolutely makes a difference. <laughs> there is exponential power to be found in coming together. There is a corporate anointing. Things happen in the unseen when we gather together. Things are happening right now because we are here together. Things happened during worship when we came together. Things happen, and I invite you to join us on Tuesday night prayer, either this side of the border or in Buffalo. When we come together united, searching, searching for his heart, together united, wanting to see his will be done, there is exponential power. But as we're talking about the importance of unity, it brings me to my third point, which is called the isolation of one. And I'm not going to linger on this point for too long because, of course, the last two years, unfortunately, we've seen isolation in ways that we, you know, many of us have never seen before. Forced isolation, forced isolation because of restrictions. Maybe we've, you know, maybe there's been concerns, so we also have decided to, to take the time to pull ourselves away. But it's important that now that we have the freedom to do this, to gather together, it is so important to buck the trend. It is so important for us to come together, to join in unity, to come together, to join under the banner of the one. It is so important to not be comfortable at home. I know it's, I know, there's tea, there's coffee at home, there's warmth, maybe a bed. But I invite you, come, come together whenever possible because there is power. I, research has shown that social isolation you know, increases the risk of mental health issues like depression and anxiety and substance abuse. It increases chronic conditions like high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. It also risks the raise, sorry, risks, yes, the raise of dementia in older adults. There is physical and mental components to being isolated because we were never meant to be isolated. The Gospels of Matthew, Jesus is recorded making a simple but powerful statement. Every kingdom divided itself against itself, sorry, will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Strife and disagreement all lead to the breakdown of a relationship. And whether that's between two people, between groups of people, it doesn't matter. Division will eventually lead to isolation. And in worst case scenarios, the affected individuals will retreat into themselves further out of anger or hurt or shame. And that, that is unfortunately when the enemy steps in. First Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like 
a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, the key phrase there is looking, because lions look for the weak and isolated to prey on, those who've been separated from the safety of the pack. The enemy is like that lion, seeking the ones who are isolated. In the savannah, despite being smaller and less powerful than the buffalo, the lions will use their stamina and intelligence to hunt those huge herbivores. By chasing the herd for hours at a time, lions wear the buffalo down and may eventually manage to separate one of the weaker herd members for the the protection of their group. And once isolated from their group, the prey target is extremely vulnerable. Division leads to isolation, which leads to vulnerability. And unfortunately, it's normally the ones who need the support the most that fall through the cracks. This is why it is absolutely vital that striving for unity as believers, as the church, it has to be a priority. It will not happen unless we make it a daily intentional choice to be peacemakers and to be conscientious with our words and our actions, making sure that we are not adding to division and that we take every opportunity to come together, to worship together, to pray together, to be together. Let nothing stand in the way of us being unified. Going back to the illustration of the prey versus predator, other groups of animals will actually form a circle with their own bodies around those that are weak and defenseless. They work together to prevent the defenseless ones from being easy prey. And so we are called to do similar. We are called to encourage, to lift one another up, to to console, to comfort to protect those who are unable to protect themselves until they are able to stand in strength themselves. Of course, the pursuit of unity can be challenging. (laughs) It can be very challenging because as much as we think it'd be, you know, sometimes easy and it'd be easy if I could just change that person's behavior. It would be easy if I could change that person's way of thinking. I mean, countless internet chat walls will obviously tell you that is not the case. The only thing that I have control over is my response in any relationship. I I can only control my own words, my own actions. That is the only thing that I have control over in relationship. And so that brings me to my final point. Forgiveness is the bridge to becoming one. God's heart has always and will always be restoration to a right relationship. And as we celebrate this season, as we celebrate Jesus, we remember that the purpose of his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection was to bridge that unimaginable gap between us and our Father God. There needed to be forgiveness of the rebellion, the sin, the desire for self-sufficiency, the self-centeredness. And through the cross, the payment was made. Forgiveness available to all those who say yes to Jesus and for those who say yes, all enmity between God and his children is forgotten, entirely removed. We can now stand in right, full relationship with God. And as we have been forgiven much, as we have been forgiven of a debt unpayable by any measure of our own strength or actions, we too are required to forgive. Because God's heart is for there to be no obstacle between the unity of his children. In Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22, Peter approaches Jesus with a reasonable question after Jesus had been just speaking about unity. It says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven, Jesus replied, but 77 times. An earlier teaching that Peter would have been party to was found in Luke 17, verse 4. And in that it said, even if that person wrongs you seven times, Jesus said, seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. So in context, it may be that Peter might have been hung up on the seven because of an earlier teaching, misunderstanding the heart behind what Jesus was saying, because it's not about the number. It's about the continued, always willingness to forgive those who have wronged us. Interestingly enough, 70 times 7 is 490. In the Bible, in Hebrew, 490 alphanumerically is the value of the Hebrew word tamim, which means complete, perfect, or finished. 
A person who can't forgive will always live in imperfect and incomplete light that lacks a true understanding of the finished, perfect, gracious work of the cross. 490 is also the value of the Hebrew phrase, let your heart be perfect, in 1 Kings 8.61. Forgiving helps make us complete and is key to perfecting our heart. Forgiveness is a necessary bridge to unity. But oh boy, <laughs> forgiveness can be hard. In fact, it, isn't it easier sometimes to say I'm sorry than to say you're forgiven? Relationships can be messy, ugly even. There is pain and hurt caused by the words and actions of others. You know, deep pain can be inflicted by those who we love and those that we trust and those that we are vulnerable to. Some of us may have experienced pain so deep that forgiveness seems unimaginable. But we can extend forgiveness in every circumstance because God is fully aware, fully aware of our limitations. He was fully aware when he said, forgive always. And so he gives us the grace and the power and the strength to do so. One of the best stories I've ever come across to just emphasize just how important forgiveness is and the power of the Holy Spirit to do so through us is the story of Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch watchmaker and later a writer who worked with her father and her sister and other family members to hide Jewish people from the Nazis during World War II. She felt honestly that she was doing God's will. And according to accounts, she and her family possibly rescued about 800 Jewish people from death during that time. But she was captured. She was found out. Her and her family were found out and sent to a concentration camp. The horror and dehumanizing treatment that prisoners experienced during their time at the concentration camp cannot be understood. Corrie's sister, Betsy, of course, was with her. And over time, um, her sister's health deteriorated, and she passed away during the concentration camp. But before she passed away, in God's grace and strength, she said to Corrie, there is no pit so deep that he, that God, is not deeper still. Twelve days later, Corrie was released from the prison. And the following is an excerpt from Corrie's book, The Hiding Place. Highly recommend it. And I've made some slight adjustments just for ease of narration. So in mid-May 1945, the Allies marched into Holland to the unspeakable joy of the Dutch people. Despite the distractions of her work, Corrie was still restless, and she desperately missed her beloved Betsy, her sister. But now she remembered Betsy's words that they must tell others what they had learned. Thus began more than three decades of travel around the world. She told people her story of God's forgiveness of sins and of the need for people to forgive those who had harmed them. Corrie herself was put to the test in 1947 while speaking in a Munich church. At the close of the service, a balding man in a gray overcoat stepped forward towards, towards Corrie to greet her, and Corrie froze. She knew this man well. He'd been one of the most vicious guards at Ravensbrück, the concentration camp, one who had mocked the women prisoners as they showered. Corey writes, it came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. And now here he was, pushing his hand out to shake mine and saying, a fine message for our line. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, Corey says, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me. Of course, how could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed free. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, you were saying. I was a guard there, but since that time he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, whose sins had again and again to be forgiven, and I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase a slow, terrible death 
simply for the asking. The soldier stood there expectantly, waiting for me to shake his hand. I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do, and I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. Standing there before the former SS man, Corrie remembered that forgiveness is an act of the will, not an emotion. Jesus, help me, she prayed. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the food. Corrie thrust out her hand, and she writes, And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. And for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized it was not my love I had tried, and I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything we could possibly need to live in complete unity is found in God and his Holy Spirit who teaches us and empowers us. Our part is to make the choice, not to hold on to anger, not to hold on to offense. Our part is to choose daily to ask for God to work in our hearts and minds. And there may not be an instant flowing of forgiveness as Corey experienced, but we know because God is faithful and that we know it is his perfect will for unity that we will get there. I'll be finishing today's service slightly differently than normal, and I'll I'll explain a little bit more. But I just want to go into my conclusion, just, just a heads up that things will be a little different. You know, I do hope that today I've been able to impart the importance of coming together as one in unity. Because we see that God himself exists in perfect relationship as the Trinity. And so as being created in his image, we too are to live in the same unity. Being a reflection the world so desperately needs to see of love and togetherness. There is exponential power to be found as we come together as one under his anointing. The stakes are too high for us not to daily, daily choose to remove any obstacles of that end goal of togetherness. The Bible time and time again calls to the body of Christ to support one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another, and be accountable together. In John 13, 35, Jesus makes this well-known statement, your love for one another, will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The world is watching, and we can show them God's unconditional love and unity expressed in how we treat and honor each other. We can be the antidote to the poison of division. My challenge to you this week, and a challenge to myself this week and every week is this, is their restoration to be made. Do I have to forgive? Do I have to ask for forgiveness? What words or actions can be spoken to promote unity? Who needs to hear that they are loved? If we approach relationship with the question, what can I give to this relationship rather than what can I take from this relationship, we make great strides towards the unity of the kingdom of God. We absolutely can place the needs of others first because we know we are protected and provided for by the one who we celebrate this very season for on behalf. Jesus, the one, is the very reason that we can celebrate unity and harmony together. It is our unity, being one under the banner of the one, that will change the world. I challenge you to gather whenever possible. Once again, come together. Those who are at home, come together wherever possible, even across the border. Find a way to get to the Buffalo Collective. Come to Tuesday night prayer. Come and see what can be accomplished when we are together as one under God, seeking his purpose. Historically, even the times, years and times and times again, when the church has been scattered, there has always been a united remnant, powerfully united, seeking and forwarding the purposes of God. 
And that is why we have the freedom to be here today, because people did not cease to come together, even in times of hardship. Let me pray to close, and then I'll explain how I'll end the service. God, thank you so much for your unconditional love. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit, for just the impartation of absolutely everything that we could possibly need to live together as a perfect, unified body under the headship of Jesus. May we never forget, Jesus, may we never forget that it's because of your death and resurrection, as we celebrate this time, it is because of what you did on the cross that we can stand in right standing with the Heavenly Father and we can stand united, united under your name, under your banner, Jesus. There is power to be found, your kingdom power, God. This is how you've created it. This is how you've designed it. We were never meant to be alone. We were always meant to function together as one big, happy family. God, may you bless, bless our thoughts and actions today. May our words promote unity. May our actions promote togetherness. May the people around us know that they are loved and they are important because they are loved by you and are important. Holy Spirit, just empower us this week to live as you've always wanted us to live. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.